Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4. Been in a series entitled One Another. And so looking at the different one another commands of Scripture, this is lesson number 10. It will be our last lesson. We'll begin a new series next week that I'm excited about. Not going to tell you about it. you got to check social media, um, and we'll send out a text about it. But uh, that way we can stay focused on this, and uh, then we'll see you back next week. For It's like watching Netflix. Like, you know, like when it says, are you still watching? All right. Um, like, I feel like we need that with Crosspoint. Like, are you still listening? Um, like the little thing, that, and it counts down like three, two, one, or whatever. If you didn't get a handout, you can throw your hand up. My favorite phrase. Okay. Jordan and Justin are coming around with those. 1 Peter chapter number 4 is where we're going to be. We're going to begin reading in verse number 7. I love the two songs that were sung this morning. Uh, Little is much when God is in it. Uh, Meaning this, that if you want God in your life and you want God to use you, I guess if we want to phrase it like that, uh, most of the time that starts with you being small and uh, little and uh, the Bible teaches us that he must increase I must decrease meaning this that the less there is of you the more there is of God the more that God can be used and so I'm thankful for that and that's going to apply exactly to what we talk about today and then also seek you first Um, it is hard to seek God's kingdom first in this life isn't it like it is just busy how many of you had a busy week you had a busy week all right how many didn't have a busy week Look at you guys. Like, I'm proud of a couple of you for saying that. That's a good thing. Like, all right. How many of you had a busy week? How many had a, some of you are like, I woke up and I lived. All right. That's a busy week. How many of you didn't have a busy week? Didn't have a busy week? Good for you. Congratulations. All right. That's awesome. Last night we were, I was like getting ready for bed and we were getting ready to go to bed. And and Lauren was like, I am so tired. And I was like, it's been a busy week. And she was like, yeah. She's like, it just seems like there's been a lot going on. I was like, yeah. And then we had Baylor in our bed for like, like she was in our room for like three nights, I think, two nights. She threw up. We made her play baseball. We're like, we're like those tough parents that it's like, you know what? You, you need to learn how to toughen up and get out there and play baseball. And so she kept saying all Monday, that it was her first game. She's like, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. It's like, you'll be all right. Get out there and hit the ball. All right, hit and run. And uh, so she always walked to the batter box, dragging her bat. And I was like, come on, Baylor, come on, get up here and hit, all right? And so after the game, she was sitting there, and she's like, I feel like I'm going to throw up. And I was like, no, you're not. And then sure enough, it was, all right? It actually started with, okay? And we're like, see, you're not going to throw up. And then it was like, all right? So the second wave was the wild one, all right? But uh, anyways, and she's, like I said, she's not dramatic at all. Um, And so uh, anyways, the night that she got in our bed, she was laying in the middle of us and she would wake up and she'd go, Daddy, I'm about to throw up, I'm about to throw up. And of course, like you hear that and you've got someone laying in your bed that's about to throw up. Well, the trash can was never on my side of the bed. So I'm like reaching for it. I'm like, Lauren, Lauren, she's about to throw up. The trash can's on your side. And like, I think that I heard that trash can hit the floor like 20 times that night. Like it was, we would knock it over and then we have to get it. You know how it is to find something in the dark? It's so fun, isn't it? Um, So anyways, that was our week, but we're here. We survived. All right. Um, but lesson number 10, we are going to be talking today from first Peter chapter number four about ministering one to another minister one to another. Let's read the passage. And then I'm going to actually give you five thoughts. I know some of you are thinking that's a lot to think about. All right. It's going to be quick. I promise. All right. Verse number seven, the Bible says this, But the end of all things is at hand. How many of you think that if Peter was writing that hundreds of years ago, that it's probably more true today, all right? That if the end was at hand then, the end is most definitely at hand now. How do we respond to that? He says, be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. It's interesting to me that the two things that he says to do at the end is to be serious, which sometimes, let's be honest, we're not great at in our Christian life, And then he says, and watch unto prayer. Give yourself to prayer. Be ready to pray. But then he continues. He says, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. We don't have a lot of time to dive into that verse, but there is so much truth in that. He says, charity covereth a multitude of sins, meaning this. Sometimes what we are guilty of doing is we are guilty of trying to drive someone through sanctification rather than love someone through sanctification, okay? 
We're guilty of trying to push them through and, and say, like, well, you've got, like, if you're here, then I need you to get here. And so we push and we push and we push. And the Holy Spirit is a much better teacher than we ever can be. Our job is to love someone through sanctification. Meaning this, that if you have someone that is experiencing sin in their life, sometimes it's not always the first move that you need to make to where you beat them across the head. Sometimes you have to show love. We've all heard the phrase that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Okay? Meaning this, that if you can confront sin with love, that is the best. That's the way Christ did it. That's the exact way that Christ showed how to confront our sins in our lives. So he says, charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Would you go and read verse number 10 out loud together with me? Verse number 10, ready, begin. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, we are called to minister. Let's pray, and for the next couple minutes, we'll talk about ministering one to another. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us once again. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this class and for this group. But I'm so thankful to have a group of people to run alongside of in this Christian life. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see the need of ministering one to another. There are many in this room that they have a ministry that they serve in. Lord, there are some that are maybe looking for a way to become involved. But the truth is, is whether we have a defined position or not in this church and in this world, Lord, we can all be ministers of the grace that we've been shown. And so, God, I ask that this week that you would help those in this room to find someone that they can minister to. Or it's someone that they can encourage, someone that they can run alongside of, someone that they can serve and be a part of lifting them up and taking them to the next level in their Christian life. And Lord, may we see our ministry as an act of service to you because of what you have done for us. Lord, we're so thankful for your sacrifice. Just last week, we celebrated Easter. And the truth is, is we have a date on the calendar that we can celebrate Easter. But for each and every one of us that are called by your name, each and every day we wake up is a day that we can celebrate your resurrection. Or is a day that we can celebrate your work on the cross. So may we do that even this Sunday. One week removed from Easter, Lord, may we worship you and may we serve you. In your name we pray. Amen. During uh, Easter, obviously, everyone feels the need to post and uh, post uh, about their Easter backdrop and their Easter picture. And there's normally people that are doing some sort of Bible reading plan leading up to Easter. And I always enjoy seeing what other people are doing. My wife and I, one of the things we do almost every Sunday night is we'll go home and we'll eat cookies, which is the the most enjoyable part, all right? But um, we'll eat cookies and we'll watch other churches' live streams. We'll, we'll watch some of the, my friends that are, are pastors or some of the churches that they work at. And I always enjoy going and watching other people's Easter services. But one of the things that I saw circulating prior to Easter was actually a little meme that said, you know, sometimes we talk about what we would do if it, we knew that it was our last couple of days on earth. How many of you have ever had that question or that thought posed to you? Like, what would you do if you knew this was your last week on earth, all right? What would you do if you knew that you only had three days to live or whatever? And for most of us, we have a plan for that. We were actually talking about it one time in a staff meeting, and one of the guys in our, uh, on our staff was like, dude, I'd go buy a car. And it was like, yeah, that's actually brilliant because if you die, like he would, he said, he was like, I would even take out like a loan for it. He's like, I'm not going to be the one that has to pay for it. All right. And so <laughs> it's actually, so some of you that are taking notes, if you ever do find out your last week to live, then there you go. All right. Um, but the meme that was circling around, it wasn't necessarily a meme. I think it was just technically a quote that someone had kind of turned into it is that basically when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, he knew that his crucifixion and that his time was at hand. He says that multiple times in the Gospels. And yet one of the things that we find him doing in his last opportunity before his crucifixion is we find him sitting down with his disciples and washing their feet. We find him serving others. We find the king of the universe bowing down to his creation and really placing himself at the lowest point that, we could, that you could in that 
that culture. Washing feet. He was serving someone else. And no matter what you think about the generation that sits in this room or, or maybe even yourself, uh, uh, how you've maybe evaluated or examined yourself, the truth is, is that service and placing ourselves at a point of ministering to others is not natural for anybody. It's not normal. It's not something that we're great at. In fact, we're normally better at finding ways to serve ourselves than we are to serve others. And just one week removed from a date that we look back on the crucifixion of Christ, I think it's important for us to see that ministering and serving those around us, serving and ministering one to another in this passage is set in the context of Jesus Christ serving others. It's interesting to me that almost every one of these one another commands that have been given have been given in the context of look at what Jesus has done for you. One of the greatest claims against Christianity by those that are currently considered young adults or Gen Z or whatever is that it's legalistic, is that it has so many rules and has so many commands. I want you to see that for 10 weeks we've been, we have looked at a command, serve one another, comfort one another, be unified one, with one another, minister one to another, and almost every single one of those commands are set in the context of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Jesus is not asking you to do something that, which he was not willing to also do and also exemplified. So I want to give us five thoughts about how we can minister one to another straight out of this passage. The first one is this. I want you to notice the precedent of ministry, the precedent of ministry. He says in verse number seven, but the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. I already mentioned this as we were reading through the passage, but if Peter believed hundreds of years ago that the end was at hand, how much more should we believe that the end is at hand? How much more should we be looking toward the heavens to see Jesus Christ return and call us home? How much more is that verse true in 2022 than when this was written just a couple years after Jesus Christ had already ascended into heaven? If they believed that then, we should believe it even more so. But watch this. He says, be sober and watch unto prayer, meaning this. Sometimes we get this concept of end times and of prophecy that when Jesus Christ returns, it's our job to hunker down and hold on till he comes. Okay? We sing songs like Hold the Fort. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that song. But the truth is, is in the last days, wouldn't it be great if the Christians of this world were not hunkered down in a fort, but were actually on the attack? That we were not just sitting there on defense, but we were pushing on offense. That we were seeing souls saved. That we were seeing people come back to him. And the precedent, the whole kind of thing, the whole arena that these verses are set in of ministering one to, no one to another is this. That the end is near. I'm not going to stand up here and be the prophet of gloom and doom, but here's what I will tell you. If Peter said that then, then it is more true now. And so our calling should not be, well, let me just kind of hang out with people. Let me. No, we should be taking more intentionally our ministry one to another. Every single person that you walk by is an opportunity to minister to. Every person that you buy something from in a drive through or at a checkout line, that's an opportunity for you to minister to. I love Susie's praise that she shared about, hey, did you have a good day? Who would have thought that a simple question of, hey, did you have a good day, would have opened the door for an opportunity to bring someone to church? I'm thankful that Susie didn't just say, hey, did you have a good day? And when she said, no, I had a bad one, <laughs> me too. <laughs> all right, let's just enjoy them together, all right? No, she uses an opportunity to point someone to Jesus Christ. And you, as a child of God and as a Christian who can ha take the word of God and say, this is what the end looks like, should be able to say, if this is what the end looks like, then I need to find someone that I can minister to. So the precedent of that, this is the thing that precedes everything else. But secondly, I want you to notice the priority of ministry. In verse number eight, he says, and above all things above all things meaning this he's now prioritizing something he says above anything else here's the call have fervent charity among yourselves i want you to think about your week this week maybe think about your month maybe think about just even the time that you have had since you walked in the doors of this church for some of you that was 22 minutes ago okay 
But think about the time that you've had in this place and in this room and, and this week around other Christians. Would your week and would your interactions with other Christians be described as fervent charity? Some of you are like, well, I didn't say anything ugly about anybody. Okay, that's not what I asked. Would it be described as fervent charity? Meaning this, did you intentionally go out of your way to love on someone this week? Remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago? Is that we almost look at people and we look at maybe the far left of something and we, and we say, well, I didn't say anything ugly or like there's these people over here that they absolutely hate this group and they gossip and they're ugly towards people and they're unkind. And so I'm not that. And so I'm just right here. So I didn't do that. That's a pretty good week. But there's this other side of that scale that we have to get to. Fervent charity is not just staying in neutral. Fervent charity means that I'm going to come over here and I'm going to go above and beyond. I'm going to maybe sacrifice a little bit of myself. I'm going to maybe love on someone that has not been lovely to me, okay? I'm going to have fervent charity toward those that I am brothers and sisters with. So does your week, is it, was it defined by fervent charity? Can I give you a quick challenge? Before you walk out of this building today, find someone that you can love on. Maybe that's a handshake, maybe that's a hug, maybe that's a prayer, maybe that's a text. If you know that someone's getting ready to go and teach in a B Sunday school class, hey, I just want you to know I'm going to pray for you today while I sit in the service. If you're singing, I'm going to pray for you. I'm excited. Thank you for the song. I'm not saying that because my wife's singing. Okay, okay, that, that, ignore that. Save that one for next week, all right? Thank you for your service this week, okay? Love on someone. If you see a guest sitting in church, hey, would you want to come sit with me? Have fervent charity, the priority of ministry, but then thirdly, the passion of ministry. The passion of ministry. I love verse number 9 and verse number 10. He says this, Use hospitality one to another <coughs> without grudging. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Verse number 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. If you have received the salvation of Jesus Christ, if you have received a gift and a blessing from God, did you know that it is not your responsibility to hold on to that? The blessings of God and the salvations of God are intended to flow through you to others. You want to know what most Christians do? Is we receive something from God or we receive the salvation that Jesus Christ paid for on the cross and we use it as an opportunity to hold it in. When the truth is, is that the love that Jesus Christ has shown you should be shown to those around you this week. If you have received grace and kindness from God, your passion should be to show that same grace and kindness to someone else. You want to know what I love to see in my own children? I love to see that when maybe I show Braxton grace towards something or I show Baylor grace in something, that she shows that same grace to Braxton or to Blakely. I, I love to see that because the grace of God and the gifts of God and the salvation of God was never intended for you to hoard, but for you to use to help someone else. The passion of your life should be, how can I get this to more people? How can I get this to show someone else? But then number four is the practice of ministry. The practice of ministry. He says this in verse number 10 at the end. He says, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. He says this. He says, you should be showing the grace of God to someone else because of how evident it is in your life. But if you are called to speak, talk about God. He says, talk about the oracles of God. Talk about what God has done in your life. Wouldn't it be great if there was a bunch of Christians that when we went through the drive through or we made an order at McDonald's or, or we called Xfinity and told them that our internet was disconnected, that we acted more like Christ than we did like everyone else? That we use it as an opportunity to share how good God had been. But you know, want to know what the truth is? 
is for most of us, when something goes wrong in a drive-thru or goes wrong with our internet or goes wrong with our cable or whatever, we use it as an opportunity to complain because it's like, well, I can't believe that, that my internet's down. I'm going to call and chew them out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fix it. Like, I'll fix this problem. And we use it as an opportunity to show our carnality more than we do to show how good God has been. And the practice of ministry is actually very simple. It doesn't always mean that you're the second grade girls teacher. It doesn't always mean that you're on the calendar to serve in the nursery. It doesn't mean that you're an usher. It doesn't mean that you have a job title. The practice of ministry is this. Simply, when I get a chance to talk about God, that's who I'm going to talk about. When I get a chance to tell someone about why my life is good and why I have joy and why I have peace and why when I get on a flight, I'm not sitting there hyperventilating, the reason why I have the opportunity to do that is because I have a good God. And when you get a chance to share that with someone else, you should take them up on it. Most Christians do not share the goodness of God for one of two reasons. Either one, because they haven't experienced it for themselves, and so therefore there's nothing good for them to talk about. Or the second one is because we have not walked with God enough to make this our passion. There's some of you that if I sat here and I said, how many of you, you say, you say God's been good to me this week, there probably every hand would go up, okay? Now let me ask you a question. Did you share that goodness with anyone? Did you talk to maybe your college uh, roommate about it? Did you, did you talk to a fellow student about it? Did you talk to a coworker about it? Did you tell anyone about the goodness of God? Either A, you have not experienced it for yourself, or B, you have not found a way to share it with someone else, and that is the practice of ministry. And then lastly, and we'll be done, notice the purpose of ministry. The purpose of ministry. He closes in verse number 11, and he says this, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Can I ask you a very simple question? Could it be that you are not ministering one to another because you're not getting the kickback for it, but God is? Could it be that you, as a child of God, want more attention than the God of heaven? You see, we quote verses like Revelation 4.11, that all things were created by him, and he has pleasure in all things, and they were created for his glory. And we, we quote verses like 1 Corinthians 10.31, that whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And sometimes you want to know what ministry looks like. Ministry looks like no one else seeing it, no one else giving you a sticker for it, you not getting a round of applause, but the God of the universe getting the round of applause. The God of heaven getting glory out of it. I love Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4 is the story of Peter and John, and they move into a town, and there's a lame man sitting there. And it's the story where they look at them and they say, these men have been with Jesus because they're unlearned and ignorant. Basically, these guys are not natural, so there's something different about them. But it's interesting to me that by the time you get down to, I believe it's verse number 21 of Acts chapter number 4, that it says that this town and these people glorified God for what was done. You know what I don't see is I don't see Peter and John when verse number 21 happens and it says they glorified God for that which was done. I don't see them saying, could we not get an Instagram post about this? Like, could we, could we not get like a cool picture of us like smiling as we bend over to help the lame man? Like, okay, like I'm about to help this lame man. All right, John, get the camera ready. All right. I don't see that happening. And sometimes ministering to someone else means that God gets the glory and no one else knows about it except God. It's interesting to me that in verse number 10, the word steward is used. I've told you this before. You want to know the difference between ownership and stewardship? Ownership makes you look good. Stewardship makes God look good. And one of the reasons why so many Christians are good at being owners of something is because it makes them look good. But we're bad at being stewards because sometimes we don't want to make God look better than we want us to look. 
And what we have got to get back to is, I'm not doing this for the applause. I'm not doing this so that I get a shout out on social media. I'm not doing this for any other reason other than that God gets the glory. And so here's a simple question to help you this week. How can you find a way to minister to someone? I'm going to ask that as we bow our heads and close our eyes, that the Holy Spirit would lay someone on your heart right now. Maybe it's a friend. For those of you who teach, maybe it's a student. Maybe it's a coworker. Who is it that this week you can say, you know what, I can